check in. I'm at the Impact Church of Nashville. If you have your Bibles and you don't mind standing to your feet, we're going to the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 14, where it reads this way. Then a certain man gave a great supper. I'm reading on the uh, New King James Version. A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported those things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame and the blind. And his servant said, master, it is done as you have commanded. And still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, go out then into the highways and into the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men who were invited shall taste of my supper. Yeah, get that in your spirit. I'm going to use for a simple subject this morning. Guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah, look at somebody and say, neighbor, guess who's coming to dinner? It'll make some sense after a while. Father, bless your word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Every society in every era has individuals and groups that are forced to exist on the outer edges or the fringes of that society. They're everywhere. These people who are treated as throwaways, rejects, castaways, if you will. They are considered the dregs of society and may be even considered expendable. I know that's a bad thing to say, but there are many countries, not just this country, but many other countries who tend to treat those kind of people as if they don't have any real contribution to our existing society and we treat them as if they are expendable. They exist in every society and first century Jerusalem was no exception. Jewish culture often edged certain people groups into the periphery of social acceptance and prevailing religious beliefs often helped keep them there. What am I saying? I'm saying that they used religion like we do today to separate people Making people, making faith exclusive rather than inclusive. Rather than using our faith and our religion as a unifying force, you saw this over the last year, we began to politicize our faith to the point that we polarized each other and people separated into different camps because we have a tendency to always use our faith not as a unifying tool, but as another reason for folks to divide. They use their belief system to marginalize people, considering certain people get this as unimportant, insignificant, and by doing so, we render them powerless. Whenever you marginalize certain people and put them into a certain class, what you do is you steal their power. You steal their voice. You steal away from them the ability to vote, to contribute to the whole, to contribute to the, to the whole of society. You want to squash them, squell them, keep them from having any kind of voice, and sometimes go as far as determine their destiny. Because we want to consider them powerless to even control their own destiny, where they can live, where they can shop, what they can buy, where they can go to school. We love to put people in categories and groups and section them off so that we can keep people powerless now here, here here are several groups it's not a complete list but here are several groups that were consistently marginalized by the Jewish community first of all women were women were considered second-class citizens 
They were up. They couldn't. They couldn't go to formal education. They couldn't go to formal school to learn religion. They couldn't own property. And in some cases, they were treated like property themselves. The poor which were marginalized because they considered them a drain on society, useless. They considered them people who were parasites on society. You, you know how sometimes you were riding down the road on an intersection, you'll see somebody standing out there uh, with a sign saying, we'll work for food. And I, for me, it's really hard to walk or ride past that person. Something in my heart leaps when I see them standing out there. But for some people, they are so heartless that they don't be moved with compassion or concern or even prayer. They just want you to get off the highway, get off my street corner. They, they'll holler out the window, get a job. Because we are mean spirited, mean hearted, and we don't even want to be confronted with the fact that there are poor among us because to us, they are a drain on our society. The chronically ill and the diseased were considered especially cursed by God. For example, those who had leprosy were relegated into camps where we pushed them away because we considered them people especially cursed by God. So if you were born with some sort of illness or disease or blindness or some kind of main disability, rather than have compassion and concern and make things easy for you, they consider these people to be outcasts, rejects, people we don't want to be bothered with. And we all know the Gentiles, we consider them that way. The Jewish people considered the Gentiles people that were less than human beings. And God help you if you were a Samaritan, because that way you were a mixed breed of Jew and Gentile. So they considered you a dog, a mongrel. Uh, half breed, not even human. There's another group. There's one last group that was kicked over to the side, and that were tax collectors. Some of you Bible scholars remember that Matthew was a tax collector when Jesus made him part of his team. And he was one that despised group of people because they considered tax collectors to be the worst kind of job you could have. Uh, they were considered leeches. Parasites on society. They considered them people who took advantage of their own people. And all these people sat as it were, in the margins. Uh -huh. And if you fell into any of those groups, the general consensus was that you were not significant enough to be included among the main system. And to ensure that you, quote unquote, stay in your place, they set up systems and structures to support their prejudices. You know, prejudice would not exist unless there's a system that supports it. Racism would not exist as long as it did in this country if there was not a system that supported it. There are legal systems. There are economic systems. It's not just a matter of uh, signing the Civil Rights Acts. There were laws. There were systems. There were attitudes in place that allow racism to continue and still continue in certain segments today. Because in order for prejudice to thrive, there has to be a system that supports it. Yeah, if you're working at a job that's consistently pushing a certain level of people or group of people out, there has to be legal systems, structures, uh, uh, cultures that support that, or else it wouldn't exist. It would just fall apart. So the Jewish community had these five peak groups of people, people groups, that they set up laws and structures to relegate them into corners, into the margins, into the outer edges of society, and not be included in the main thing. Being excluded is a terrible thing. It is a degrading thing. It is an unnerving thing to think that I could walk into a place like this and somebody forces me to sit in some corner because I've fallen into some kind of group, women group, illness, sickness, economic status, where, where you have to come in and sit on that side. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? And yet we do this unconsciously even in our own interactions in church. That certain people we relegate to certain responsibilities and push them to certain places. And we, we don't say it, but by our actions, we ignore their presence in our midst. If you don't look like us, if you don't dress like us, if you don't speak like us, if you don't come from my side of town, if you don't know my folks, we don't know your folks. We have a subtle way of making people feel uncomfortable, even in a place like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when Jesus showed up on the scene, Michael, he turned the whole system upside down. Jesus messed everybody up. He came against the systems and the structures by the preaching of the gospel to the point that at one place, uh, Deacon Finister, he walked into one place of worship where they were turning God's house into a place of merchandise and he kicked over the tables. 
He flipped over the table. And I come to tell somebody, some of you are worshiping and sitting at tables that God has flipped over. You have worshipped your systems, your structures, the way you do church to the point that God can't even get in. If he doesn't do it the way we do it, the how we do it, the first Sunday, the third Sunday, you don't want to be involved in it. And I believe even through this revival that God was just kicking over the tables. Because he wanted some people in here to get up from that table. Get up from your table of prejudice. Get up from your table of attitudes. Get up from your way of doing things and let me do what I do. God kicked my table over. I don't want to be sitting at a table that Jesus is not sitting at. God will kick your table over. He'll kick your table over if he got to mess with your money. He'll kick your table over if he got to touch your kids. He'll kick your table over if he got to touch your body. Look at somebody say, get off that table. Flipped their whole system on the end. Through the preaching of the gospel, this is what Jesus did that shocked everybody. This is what really got him killed. He started coming against the systems. He threw the doors open and invited people in that most people wanted to keep out. That's why they didn't like him. He didn't steal nothing. He didn't take nothing. He didn't hurt nobody. He didn't murder nobody. It's just that they were so married to their system. That Jesus coming in, and we heard it over the revival, being disruptive, messed up their system. And forced them to have to live with, deal with, interact with people that we normally wouldn't be bothered with. He invited people in that all of us wanted to keep out. The greatest thing that Jesus' ministry did was it gave dignity and value to those who sat in the margins. That's why you ought to be glad. If you fell into any of those groups that I had in here, every woman in here ought to be shouting right now. Because as much as you were marginalized and kicked aside and said you can't preach, you can't speak, you can't stand, you, if, if anybody else, ought to be giving God praise for Jesus' ministry who loosed his daughters. Every daughter in this house, give God praise right where you are. I mean, take over this place. Thank God for Jesus. If Jesus hadn't showed up, they'd still be trying to put their foot on my neck. So Jesus, Jesus uses the story of a certain man who threw a great feast to illustrate for us what the kingdom would actually look like versus what we think it looks like. You know, there is a discrepancy between what God calls the kingdom and what we call the kingdom. There seems to be an issue because what God has in mind is so much different from what we have in mind. What we call kingdom is everybody who looks like us, thinks like us, dresses like us, do what we tell them to do. We like to use kingdom to control you rather than free you. Oh, you preaching, facing. And Jesus showed us who would be included. And also, here's the word, who would be invited. <laughs> It will not be filled with just the affluent, the educated, the powerful, the wealthy, or the popular. That's not what the kingdom would look like. But there would be a whole other class of people, a group of people who would be invited to attend as well. These people would be considered by us as misfits. They don't seem to fit in anywhere. They don't seem to fit in any particular group or club or clique. And I'll be honest, some of you in here right now, you found solace in the church because even in the world, you found yourself always on the outside. That you hung with people, but you was always the oddball out. That somehow, if you were on the basketball team, there was always something strange about you. That even if you was in the group, in the club, in the gang, there was always something really weird about you. I hung with people that did what I did, but I was always a little bit oddball, misfit. I didn't quite fit over there, and I didn't quite fit over here, and I didn't quite fit in with them, and I didn't quite fit in with those. And the strangest thing, I'm trying to find my place. Do I fit with the black folks? Do I fit with the white folks? Do I fit with the gang members? Do I fit with the educated folks? And some of us all your life, you have felt like and been treated like a misfit. And that's because God has marked you from the foundation of the world. And he made it on purpose that no matter what you did with your life, you will never, ever fit in. Yeah. 
Oh, y'all ain't gonna talk to me. This ain't for the folks that always had the folks that, that fit in. This ain't for the people that always had the group. This ain't for the, this is for anybody in here who's ever felt like a misfit, a weirdo, a strange. I don't talk like they talk. I don't think like they think. I don't know why. I think like I do. Somehow we're in the same room and the same thing. They're laughing at stuff that's not funny to me. They're motivated by things that don't turn me on. And even though I call them quote unquote my friends, we don't think the same way. We don't act the same way because there's always something. How many do you sense that God has always had something strange about you? I've been a misfit all my life. All my life I've been a misfit. All my life I kept trying to fit in with certain kinds of people. And I thought I could roll with certain people. But somehow when I thought I was in God, let me know you're not with him. That you're with them, but you're not of them. And so here are these misfits, these rejects, people that were rejected by men, <laughs> but chosen by God. How many know that you'd rather be rejected by men and be chosen by God? That God will make room because here comes the misfits. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. It's that certain group of people in here that have felt a little bit in the margins on the outside, didn't quite connect, didn't quite fit Jonathan, didn't quite go with it, and you felt like a misfit all of your life. I don't quite fit in anywhere. And so I'm gonna talk to you about three things and I'm gonna get out of your way. I'm gonna talk to you about the refusal, if you're taking notes, the refusal, the reaction, and finally, the replacements. The refusal, the reaction, and finally, the replacement. Y'all ready? Let's go. In Jewish society, throwing banquets was a big deal. And refusing an invitation by somebody who was of high society was considered an insult. If somebody who had upper class or status invited you to an event, and you, with your petty self, decided, I'm not going, it was an insult. Certain people, certain people, I know we got class and etiquette here, but there are some people who don't, and they don't realize that certain invitations you can't turn down. That, that for example, if you got an invitation from the White House, you have to go. You must go. There are certain people in societies, because of their status, their importance, that when they send you an invitation, you can't just throw it in the trash. You at least have to RSVP. You at least have to respond and say, I got the message, right? You can't just blow it off like Pookie down the street. You do know that, right? You do know there are certain people, and in Jewish society, that was e equally so. So it was, an, it, was a, it was an insult to turn down an invitation. But in our text, when this man threw a feast, one by one, they gave excuses as to why they could not come. Underline the word excuses. This wasn't reasons. It was excuses. You know, excuses are things that you make up when, 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 when you don't want to do something that they want you to do. <laughs> and you try to justify either you're not doing it or justify you doing something that you shouldn't do. And so you make up excuses. It's a perfect picture of those who reject, watch me here, who reject the invitation of the gospel. That when God calls you, when he calls you out of sin, when he calls you out of a situation, when he calls you to a feast, into fellowship with him, we have an amazing way of making up excuses as to why we can't answer. That for some of you, God has been calling you to a certain level of prayer, to a higher place of praise for years and years and years. And every time God pins you down and confronts you, you come up with every kind of excuse not to serve the Lord. Oh, y'all looking uncomfortable. You, you make up every kind of excuse, anything. Dinner invitations were typically extended to family or friends or at least people that you thought you were friends with. It was a friendly thing. Being invited to dinner was not a punishment. It was an honor. If somebody great or important invited you to dinner, it was something that you enjoyed, in particular if you had a relationship with that person. 
To think that somebody of such high class and such high influence would invite little old me because they think that I'm a friend or they consider me a friend and that they would invite me, that they would step over their social class and reach down and say, I want you to have dinner with me. The invitation itself was making a statement. And here is God who is the God of heaven, the glory of the God of glory, the God of everything. And he's inviting you. Here is a holy God who sits high and looks low, but yet he invites you. Who are you that God would invite you? Here is a holy God. Here is a holy God who sits up in heaven, who has everything at his disposal, who has angels who sit around and do nothing but praise him all day long. And who are you that he would ask you to praise him? That he would ask you to give him something that he has created beings that do that for him all the time. That when God gets ready to be praised, he ain't got to find nobody. He's got angels that sit up in heaven all day long and fly around the throne crying, holy, holy, holy. That the Bible said that the plants and the trees and the grass are right now praising God and clapping their hands. And to think that God, who doesn't need anything, looks at you and says, all I want from you is gratitude, is praise. That God, who doesn't need anything or doesn't need anybody who is complete all within himself, would invite you to a dinner with him. That is enough alone for you to give God praise. Do I have to go worse? When you think about the hole that he pulled you out of, when you think about all the alcohol you drink, all the drugs you drink, all the people you slept with, all the lies you told, all the dirt you did, and God would still invite you to anything, I wish you would sit there and act like you deserve what you got. You better give God a praise in here for just calling you. Just the invitation alone should make you want to run around this building that God would call me. <laughs> I want you to come to my dinner. I want you to come to my house. But these men didn't have that kind of attitude. In fact, they refused the invitation, Dre. And refusing the invitation was problematic. In fact, their refusal was very telling. Because what they were doing was really revealing a hidden hostility. See, I invited you because I thought we was cool. I thought that if I called you, it would change the nature of our relationship, that you would drop your hostility and welcome to my house. Who would invite somebody to the house you don't like? <laughs> the fact that you're here is a sign that I like you. The fact that I played a, set a place for you is enough to let you know how I really feel in my heart about you. I wouldn't have even called you if I didn't want you. I was sharing with a friend of mine that I know it's like to be invited someplace to preach, and when you get there, they mistreat you. I've been through that. Yeah, yeah, they invite you all the way across town, fly you in, put you in a hotel, get up and preach, and then mistreat you. And what's, what's crazy about that, why would you call me if you didn't want me? I only go places where I assume that you want me. And I assume if you called me, you rung my phone, I was minding my business. I was cutting the grass. I was outside in the pool. And you called me, interrupted my day to call me. And my assumption is that if you went through all that pressure, if you went through all that work to come get me or call me, that you must want me. Don't you understand that God went through all he went through going to the cross and dying because he wanted you? It's not that he needs you. Some of you, your problem is you think God needs you. You can leave this church and God will bring in 10 people that look just like you. He don't need you. He wants you. There's a difference when I need you than when I want you. See, if I need you, it puts me in a different posture. I can't make it without you. I can't live without you. I can't eat without you. It puts me, sis, in a different posture. But it's a whole different game if I have you here because I want you. Look at somebody and say, God wanted me. That's why I'm here. That's why he reached in the club and got me, because he wanted me. That's why he reached around the corner and pulled me out, because he wanted me. He didn't need me. He didn't have to have me, but he looked beyond my faults, and he saw my needs, and he put together a feast, and he called every one of us to a feast. Everybody that's called it here, give God your best praise right here. I feel something stirring. Sit down. But these men blowing off this invitation 
really revealed their hidden hostility and their attitude toward the invitee. Yeah. And what you don't understand, beloved, is when God is calling you, some of you are like they're trying to run, that are trying to put it off, that are trying to delay it. What you are conveying is your attitude about the one who's called you. The one who called you knew that you weren't perfect. And he knows that you have insecurities. And he knows that you have issues. And he knows that you're afraid that when you get up there, your knees will be knocking. But he called you anyway. He already knows what things that you wrestle with on the inside that make you intimidated to answer the call. But when God calls you, at least have in your heart a yes. Somebody throw your hands up and say yes. But it, 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 it revealed a hidden hostility. It was an attitude. This was a friendly gesture to invite you to a party. And it's like reaching your hand out. Somebody smack your hand. When the man reached out and said, hey, will you come? He smacked his hand. I don't want to come to your party. Uh, and how do you know this face? It? Because every excuse they gave was something they could have done another time. Every excuse they gave, Deacon Finister, was something that they could have done later. One man said, well, I got to go check on my property that I bought. Well, you already bought the property. <laughs> you got to do it today. You got to do it tonight. You couldn't do that tomorrow. Yeah, the one man said, oh, I can't come because I just got a wife. You can't bring her with you? You can't do a plus one? <laughs> 365 days a year, you couldn't give them one afternoon, one evening? Oh, the one that got me the worst, Shannon, was the guy that said, uh, I got to go check on my oxes. I got to try my oxes. Now, you ain't going to try your oxes at night. You test your oxes in the daytime. The only thing you're going to do with your oxes at night is, is shovel an uh, ox dung. That's the only thing you're going to do with your ox at night is shovel up crap. I got to put it there because... <laughs> You out there, you, now you know somebody really don't like you when I'd rather be shoveling crap than come to your party. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sign that somebody really don't, I'd rather be out here doing anything. I'm out here smelling with these oxen, shoveling up crap because I, that's when they really don't like you. I'd rather be doing this mess, this mess, than coming to your table. So them giving excuses was just revealing their attitude about the one who invited them. Truth of the matter was they lacked priorities, but further than that, they had no intentions of coming. They had no intentions of coming. You know, th this is what I found out about people. I found that people find a way to do what they really want to do. When people really want to do something, they get creative about it. They don't make excuses, they come with solutions. <laughs> For example, Catherine, when people want to stay together, they get creative. They find ways to work it out. They find ways to get through the issues. The only time that problems become insurmountable is when they don't really want to be with you anyway. When they want to be with you, they'll go to counseling, they'll turn, they'll twist, they'll move, they'll change stuff, they'll adjust. Because they really want to be with you. They'll communicate. They will find solutions. People who stay married 20, 30, 40 years, it's not they didn't have problems, they just look for solutions. When people use every little thing as a reason not to do what you ask them to do, it's a sign that they really didn't want to do it anyway. Because suddenly when you try, I try to make you do something that you really don't want to do, everything becomes an obstacle. My dog ate my cat. <laughs> I can't come. <laughs> they got on my nerves at the job. I can't come. And that's fine when you're dealing with me and dealing with us. But some of you have that same attitude when it comes to God. Everything becomes an excuse becomes insurmountable. I just can't do it. And I know you fake it because everything you want to do, you find a way to do it. When you wanted that man, couldn't nothing stop you. I wish you would look at me. When you wanted him, he was crazy, had one eye, and just got out of jail. But you wanted him. And couldn't nobody tell you nothing. When you wanted her, you would climb every mountain, you would swim every stream because you wanted her. 
No mountain was too high. No valley was too low. You sound like Dinah Ross around here. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough to keep me from you. It's only when it comes to God that everything becomes so big, I can't get over it. I can't get over my childhood. I can't get over my hurt. I can't get over my last pastor. I can't get over my church. But anything else you want to do, you can step right over top of it and get to it because God is not a priority. Anything you want to do, you find a way to do it. It's only when it comes to God, when a minor problem becomes an inconvenience and something that was minor becomes major for you to overcome. Can I dig into some more? The, the other thing that stood out to me, Shannon, when I was reading this was that the Bible said that they all with one accord. The King James Version said with all with one consent. That what they happened was they all got together and decided we not going. <laughs> it's not I'm not going. It's, it's we not going. The Bible said they read it for yourself. They all with one accord consented together. <laughs> Consent means agreement. Together they had conspired to be absent from the event. Am I preaching up in here? Together they decide, oh my God. And you can always tell when certain people groups have gotten together and talked because they all use the same language. They almost use the same vernacular. They almost use the same sentence verbatim. We all said the same thing. So you know they've been in a group and decided we're not going. <laughs> we're not going you gotta watch that group think how, how in the world did me turn into we God sent you a personal invitation how did your personal invitation turn into a we because when God calls you to do something I gotta get together with my girl with my friend with my family with my homies with my crew I gotta get together with my clique and we gotta decide so we decided we ain't coming <laughs> people have an amazing way of getting together in groups when they don't want to do something are you going child no i ain't going well we ain't going either and so they sent back a group invitation we ain't coming <laughs> we all gonna be absent from the dinner <laughs> i thought it was just mark that wasn't coming I didn't know it was going to be Mark and all them. <laughs> I was cool with Mark couldn't come. That's somebody I got replaced. But now I got Mark and all them, you know, all them. And it's so funny, Catherine. They almost use the same vernacular. I've had them walk in my office one by one, and it's almost like they rehearsed it. They rehearsed what they was going to say. And they all one by one come in and use the same language and the same vernacular because we tend to be victims of group think. So the Bible says they all with one accord said we not coming. That's what happened. Let's talk about the reaction. Because if it had been me, Jonathan, I would have been down there trying to figure out why. I'm going to come down there. You ain't come to my party? Well, Why? I'm going to try to help you find solutions. I'm going to try to help you figure out how to get around the things that you don't want to do. <laughs> Have you ever done that? You got somebody, you're trying to talk them into doing something that you want them to do, and they give you 15 objections, and now your job becomes to overjump, overcome their objections. Stop it. Stop it. Stop giving people excuses. Try, stop trying to figure out what they want to do. People are grown. People do what they want to do. So, so, so here's, I like the man's reaction because what he did was rather than labor with them and wrestle with them and try to untie this knot, the attention of the household holder quickly turned. It just turned. He didn't argue or fuss with them or fight with them and call them up and say, why can't you come? His face just turned. <laughs> Rather than keep wrestling with them and coming to the house and saying, well, you know, I got this party going on. He just turned his face and said, go to the highways and the byways. Let me say this. The answer is not always in the places that you think. When you're looking for God to answer through somebody, you have to stop looking in the places that you always looked. That sometimes the answer that you're looking for is not where you think is going. How to make it plain. It's not going to always be your aunt and them. That's not going to always be your support. 
It's not going to always be your, your, your classmates. It may not always be the people in your race or your culture. Stop looking for people that look like you. I ain't buying them from no white people. How crazy is that? I ain't buying them from no black people. I ain't buying them from no woman. I can't receive the word from no woman. Stop, stop it. It ain't going to always come through who you want. I'm not coming. That's my favorite speaker preacher. Stop it. Sometimes God will put what you need in a vessel that you did not expect. And you'll never see the people that are for you as long as you focus on those who are not. Oh, God. Go into the highways and the byways. Rather than keep wrestling with Mike and wrestling with him to try to get him to do something he don't want to do, turn your face. And I hear God telling somebody here, turn your face. You've been crying with them long enough. You've been fussing with them long enough. You've been wrestling with them long enough. Turn them loose. Turn them loose. Turn them loose. You're wasting time. You're wasting energy. Sometimes you'll be so busy focusing on people that are not for you that you waste time and energy and resources for people who are not going to go anyway. And rather than keep wasting your energy on them, he turned his face. And he started finding somebody who really wanted to do it. Stop wasting time with them. Don't call them another day. Don't email them. Don't text them. Don't call them. Don't send them a... Yeah, I got one backup. See, she always back me up. Stop crying about it. Stop having a meeting about it. Stop calling all your homies and fussing about it. Turn your face. Look at somebody say, turn your face. Turn your face. Turn your face in the other direction. There is somebody over there that God has for you. There is somebody that God's going to bless you with favor. And you'll never get it as long as you stay over. Oh, God. They're stealing your energy, sis. They're stealing your resources. They're stealing your time. How much time do you think you have to keep beating your head up against somebody who don't want to? Turn your face. Yeah, God has got somebody waiting on you. God has got somebody that's ready to bless you. God has got somebody that your blessing is going to be in. God has got somebody who's waiting for an answer. God has got somebody who's going to take your ministry to the next level, but you can't see it. Yeah, let that sizzle in your spirit. Let that, is it possible that the person that God has the answer you need is somebody that's not even in your church or your city or your family or your clique or your denomination and God has hidden that blessing inside that person waiting for you to grow up and get outside your clique? Okay. Okay. Sit down. Turn your face. Turn your face. The assignment given to them was this, Sister Finister. Gather everybody you can so that, so that my house can be full. This is not about you. It's not about your ego. This is so that God's house can be full. This is not about us four and no more. It's so that God's house can be full. Nobody throws a party expecting the house to be empty. Nobody throws apart. And, and look at these foolish people who thought that if we don't come, it ain't going to be no party. <laughs> if we don't come, ain't going to be no church. If we don't come, ain't going to be no business. God said, oh my God, I got somebody. And just when it looked like, sis, it was going to be right. See, see, when you, oh God, I got to go back. See, see. When, when, when you're desperate for people, desperate people do desperate things. When you're desperate for people, it leaves you open to manipulation. Because once people know you need them, they start doing crazy stuff to control the relationship. It could be anything like withholding love, withholding resources, withholding support. And it's their way of wrestling you down and making you cry uncle. And if you're somebody who is not confident in what God is able to do, you will succumb to their manipulation. 
And every time they want to control something or move something, they just withhold. They become absent. Their, their absence is sending you a message. For somebody, you ain't got to keep asking them how they feel about you. Their absence is sending a message. Your absence is talking louder than you would if you were talking. You don't have to tell me how you feel about me. Your absence told me everything I need to know. Oh, I can sit down on that. I can, I can go home on that. Your absence. You ain't got to send an email or text or nothing. Your absence with your excuse that didn't hold water told me everything I needed to know. Am I preaching up in here? And just when it looked like this is a controlling spirit, sis. Oh, God. I'm trying to abbreviate the message and go on to the baptism. It's a controlling spirit. And all they're trying to do is control everything. They want to run everything. They want to have manipulate everything. And so they get together with the group that think like them. And just when it looked like they was going to win, all of a sudden, coming up over the hill. I thought I was going to die when you left. My heart was broken and I was worried. But I looked over the hill. And coming up the hill were the blind folk. And the main folk. And the crippled folk. And all of them were coming into the party. Guess what? Here come the replacements. Oh, I'm preaching. For everybody that's sitting down saying, I ain't got time. I don't want to be bothered. I got something else to do. Let he that is simple be simple still. Because here come the replacements. Look at somebody and say, I was sent here to replace somebody. I was sent here to replace somebody. Somebody that didn't want to go. Somebody that wouldn't go for God. Somebody that kept saying no. God said, that's all right. Sit on down. Just go and sit down. Because right over your shoulder. <laughs> here come the replacements. Look at somebody say, here come the replacements. Here come the replacements. For all of you that are overseeing ministries and you're worried about whether or not you're going to have support, God said to tell you, here come the replacements. For all you that are crying because somebody left you, God said, here come the replacements. He left you, said you was a dog, said you never had nobody. That's all right, to the left, to the left. Everything you got in the box to the left, right over your shoulder, right behind you, is somebody that's better than you, look better than you, talk better than you, act better than you, go on with your crazy self. If you're leaving, leave. Just get out the way. Get out that seat because I got to, Stop taking up my space. Stop taking up my resources. Stop calling my phone. Stop ringing my email. Get out my life if you're going. Because once you leave, here come the replacement. Look at somebody and say, here come the replacements, baby. If you wonder why I'm happy when certain crazy folk leave, it's because for every crazy person that leave, God said I'm sending a replacement. You ain't got to bow to it. You ain't got to cower to it. You ain't got to fall on your knees and beg nobody. I got somebody that's going to bless you like you never seen. I wish I had a church up in here. I wish I had a church up in here. Somebody give God praise for sending a replacement. I lost my job, but I got a better job. I lost my spouse, but I'm going to get a better spouse. I lost my position, but I'm going to get a better one. Somebody give God 30 seconds of praise right here. That's number three, the replacements. Your rejection just created an opportunity for somebody else. While you were saying no, 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 somebody that didn't have nothing, somebody was just glad that God would call them, was saying yes, yes, yes. While you were saying I ain't got time, somebody was over there praying, Lord, if you call me, if you ever call me, if you ever ring my doorbell, if you ever come by my house, I won't reject you. I won't push you away. If you don't want this God, I want him. Somebody that wants this God, jump on your feet and give God a praise. I want him. If you're going to act like God ain't real, that's fine with you. But for everybody that knows God is real, give God a crazy praise right here. I want him. I want him. I want him. If you don't want him, the stripper's going to come. If you don't want him, the drug addict's going to come. If you don't want him, I want him. 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 See, now let me tell you this. God said to tell somebody that this is going to be a season 
that God is going to surprise you with the people that he's going to use. In this season, God is going to use people that you wouldn't think. In this season, God is going to use people that's been overlooked. In this season, God is going to use people that we threw away. In this season, God is going to use people that you did not expect. In this season, God is going to call people that you rejected. In this season, God is going to anoint people that you look past God. Somebody should be happy in here. Because for some of you, you've been overlooked so long, you're developing a complex. The devil's making you think they don't want you. That something's wrong with you. That something particularly crazy or weird about you. But God said to let you know that in this season, you're about to go from the background to the forefront. You're about to become the head and not the tail. You're about to be above and not beneath. Oh, you ain't happy in here. You're about to become the giver and not the borrower. Oh, you ain't happy in here. You're about to be the one in charge and not be. Oh, my God. Look at somebody say, it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. If you want to know where the anointing is going to fall in this next generation, it's not going to be the people that you thought. The God has got a Moses on the backside of the desert. You ain't never heard their name. You didn't even know the gift was down in them. You were working beside them every day and didn't know what you were sitting next to. You brushed past them in church and didn't even know what you were dealing with. Some of you in here, some of you in here, I suspect that some people don't even know what they're looking at. Sis, because when they look at you, they look at your hair or look at your size or look at what you drive and they judge you based on their, what they see. But they lack discernment, Catherine, and all they got is their carnal eyes. They don't have a spiritual eye, Daphne, to see something great in you. But God said that greatness in you is about to take center stage. I had you praying in secret for a season. I had you praying in secret for a reason. I had you praising me in secret for a reason. Because the God that sees in secret, he's going to reward you openly. Everybody that's getting ready for an open blessing, give God a praise. You don't hear this. If you heard this, we shut the service down. God said, whatever you've been praying in secret, I'm about to do it in front of everybody. You better jump on your feet and give God praise for... When I bless you, you ain't got to explain it to nobody. Just let them watch you be... Watch me be blessed. Watch me be blessed. Watch me come into victory. Watch me. I can show you, sis, better than I can tell you. Slap about three people around you and tell them it's my turn. It's my turn. It's my turn. I've been waiting in the wings. I've been waiting in the corner. I've been waiting in the background. I've been waiting in obscurity. But it's my turn. Listen. They were poor, they were crippled, they were blind, they was uncertain. When they hobbled up to the door, they wasn't even sure if they was going to get in. And the folks outside were laughing. I know she not getting in. I, I know she not getting here. Not with her crazy self. Not with her blind self. Not with her crippled self. But hey, hey, can you imagine when the crippled man hobbled his way up to the door and just when they thought that he wasn't going to be let in, the door swung open. And here was the master saying, come and die, come and die. You thought I wasn't going to get in. You thought I wasn't going to make it because I was blind. But God... You was laughing, but I'm getting in. You was talking about me, but I'm getting in. You tried to put me down, but I'm getting in. You tried to put your foot on me, but I'm getting in. Hey, Jonathan, it's something about knowing 
that you're invited somewhere that gives you a certain amount of confidence. Yeah. yeah. It's something about knowing that I've been invited somewhere that's comforting and it's empowering. It's something about pulling up to the door and knowing my name is on the VIP list. That lets me stick my chest out a little bit further. See, I didn't crash this party. I didn't sneak in the back door. I didn't overcome nobody and break in. God invited me here. I'm VIP. I'm special. I'm called. You might not think I'm VIP, but God thinks I'm VIP. You might think I'm a nobody, but God thinks I'm a somebody. And when he ushers me into, into his presence, he ushers me into... Truth be told, some of you, you know you shouldn't be as blessed as you are. Don't sit there and act like you should be. Don't let me fool out and get up in your family tree. And pull crazy Uncle Willie out the tree. And crazy Aunt Mary and all them. And your cousin Pookie and them. With your background, with your upbringing, you shouldn't be living in the house you live in. You shouldn't be driving what you drive. Oh, I wish you would sit there on me. You shouldn't even have what you had. But God blessed you anyway with your crazy self, with your crippled self, with your blind self. You Look at him, Sarita. They can't even see coming in the house. Somebody had to lead them in, but they kept coming anyway. I'm not sure what's going to happen when I get there. I'm not sure if he's going to reject me, but I'm called. I'm coming anyway because I'm called. I'm trying to talk to somebody in here who's making your excuse be, I don't have the equipment, and I don't have the training, and I don't know nobody. But God said, keep walking in my direction anyway. I got a blessing waiting on you. I got some. If you just keep walking, if you just throw your hands up and say yes. See, see, some of you. The problem with some of you is you got your critics in your ear. Sharita, that's what they got. They got the critics in their ear. And every time they get ready to do something great for God, that voice keeps coming back in their ear saying, you know you ain't got the equipment. You know you ain't got the chops. You know you ain't got the goods. And I may not, but I'm still called. <laughs> Here's the thing about God. Here's the thing about the host. When the host sent the invitation to those who were living in the bushes, in the highways, in the groves, uh, he already knew what they were going to look like when they got there. He already knew, Tanya, there's going to be smelly. <laughs> he already knew they was going to be nasty. He already knew they were going to have issues. But he called them anyway. I come to talk to somebody in here who's wrestling with a call from God. who's making excuses saying, God, but what about this and what about that? And God said, I already knew that when I called you. I had already envisioned a place for you right here. I already set a table for you, and I knew what you were going to look like when you came. It's not like when you showed up, God didn't know that you was an ex-offender. It's not like he didn't know how many people you slept with. It's not like he didn't know about the drugs in your veins. It's not that he didn't know that you were a closet homosexual. It's not that he didn't know. I already knew that, but I called you anyway. <laughs> Fix my mic because I want to hear me good. I called you anyway. And all you got to have enough faith to do is to walk in my direction. <laughs> if you just walk in my direction, I already know what you're dealing with. Forget the critics. God's going to shock some people in here. God's going to bless some people in here so much, it's going to leave your enemies with their mouths hanging open. I never thought you would get it. <laughs> I never thought you'd be a first lady. You? Not you. I never thought you'd be a pastor. I never thought you'd be a recording artist. I never thought you'd be an author. I never, as much drugs as you sold in these streets, dog, I never thought you'd be a pastor. <laughs> and the reason why many saints can get a breakthrough is because you're trying to fool us. So you, you try to dress it up and act like you don't know what I'm talking about. But God says, I see beyond your mask. And part of what qualified you to get to the table was because you were halt and blame and blind and maimed. And those who I invited before, 
They rejected it, but it became an opportunity for you. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. For somebody, God said to tell you they're, they're, they're holding your job, but they're just a place holder. They're a space holder. They're living in a house that I got ordained for you. Yeah, thank you. They're enjoying a position right now that I really ordained for you to walk in. And I just got them holding in place until you get yourself together and decide that you're going to answer the call of God and say yes. Somebody lift your hands right here and say yes to the Lord. I sense God talking to somebody in here. He wants to tell you to tell him yes. I don't know what God is talking to you about. I don't know what God is dealing with you about. But I hear God saying all I want from you is a yes. Away with your excuses. Away with your reasons. You ain't got to tell me nothing. I already knew everything when I called you. But I called you anyway. I called you anyway. I called you anyway. And just imagine. This is what gets me, Michael. Just imagine people who were used to being rejected, right? I'm used to people not letting me in. Every time I show up at the, at the party, they don't let me in. Is your name on the list? No, go away. I developed a complex about it. So now, with a God who is calling me, I'm still wrestling with the rejection. Some of you are wrestling with a spirit of rejection. You're used to people telling you no. You're used to people pushing you aside. You're used to people saying you're not tall enough, you're not short enough, you're not smart enough, you're not gifted enough, you don't preach like so-and-so, you don't sing like so-and-so, that there's no place for you. And then when God turns around and makes a place for you, this is what I don't understand, Deacon Finister. When God opens a door and puts you in a place, why are we so quiet? When God gives you a job, after you didn't have a job, how can you come to church and be so quiet? When God gave you a house, I mean a bad house, and all you had was an apartment with four kids living on top of each other, and then you had enough to come to church? Can you imagine these men showing up at the door? Can you imagine, Brother Tony, how excited they were to come in the room and sit at the table and they weren't nervous you know how people do when you ain't supposed to be sitting somewhere they come and tap you on your shoulder you come up <laughs> you nah it's just the vip you got to get up they ain't gotta sit there and be nervous because nobody was tapping them on their shoulder they're not worried about nobody coming to get the house or get the car they can sit down and rest so when god has given you rest the least you can do is sit in that place and be thankful. Can you imagine how grateful they were? How excited they were? How thankful they were? I want all the thankful people in here to give God 30 seconds of your best praise right here. You ain't thankful. You ain't thankful. You ain't thankful. You ain't thankful. Michael, they ain't thankful. You ain't thankful that you had a roof over your head. You ain't thankful God gave you a job. You ain't thankful God touched your body. All the thankful people take over this room for 30 seconds. Hey, I'm Pastor Derek Faison and I am the lead pastor for the Impact Church of Nashville. I just wanna say how glad I am that you have stopped by our YouTube channel. You're gonna find some great material on this channel that's gonna help you and challenge you in your walk with God. Keep coming back. Make sure you subscribe. Share as many videos as you like. This vehicle is what we've chosen to be the place where we could continue to do discipleship, mentoring, training, and teaching. Also, you better keep up with any place I'm speaking around the country, around the city, or around the world. So make sure you subscribe. Make sure you subscribe and share with your friends. I just want to welcome you again to our YouTube channel.